Welcome back to MPT. In this video, we're going to discuss four antenna types that are vital for many communication and radar systems. We'll discuss each of them and then take a deep dive into the design of one of them. Be sure to watch to the end and then download the Circular Waveguide Antenna Excel spreadsheet I've linked below. Get your product to market faster with a custom phased array solution from MPT Corp. As you may already know, antennas are essential components for almost all communication and radar systems. Without the right antennas, deployment of most of these systems would be impossible. That's why we're gonna discuss what may be the most important antennas that are used in radar and communication systems. For one of them, we'll take a deep dive into the technical details and the main parameters. The first is the dipole antennas. This may be the most commonly used antenna and has been used since the early days of radio communications. I have personally designed and prototyped dipole antennas operating from 7 megahertz to 40 gigahertz. In fact, I was 16 years old when I designed and built my first dipole antennas. The first ones were 7 megahertz and 146 megahertz for amateur radio operation. One of the most recent dipole antennas that MPT developed was at 3.6 gigahertz for a 5G mobile system. The images show many types of dipole antennas and a few of them are ones that MPT has developed. I've thought about the reasons that dipole antennas are so widely used and used over such a wide frequency range of applications. One of the attractive features of this antenna is that it can be relatively straightforward to design. Another is its symmetrical radiation pattern, and those may be the reasons that it's so widely used. One of the challenges in developing dipole antennas is that they require a balance. This is because the electronics in most communication and wireless and radar systems have antenna connectors that are single-ended, such as coax or a microstrip transmission line. However, the dipole antenna needs a balanced connection, such as a two-wire line. Therefore, a balance is used to make this transformation from single-ended to balanced connection. A relatively recent advancement in dipole antennas is the so-called tightly coupled dipole antenna. It has particular advantages for phase arrays, such as wide frequency operation and performance over wide scan angles of the array. Many different types of tightly coupled dipole antennas have been developed over the last decade or so, and MPT has recently added this type of antenna to our arsenal of antenna solutions for our customers. The second type of antenna is the planar inverted F antenna. It's an extremely common antenna for many wireless applications. For instance, Wi-Fi, IoT, and mobile phones use this type of antenna. It's not an exaggeration to say that billions of inverted F antennas have been deployed in the last several decades. In MPT, we use the inverted F antenna in a wireless IoT device. Recently, I have been thinking about the reasons why the inverted F antenna is so popular. I've concluded that there are three main reasons. One is that the inverted F antenna does not require a balance connection since the balance type function is built into the antenna. Another reason is that it's compact and small. In addition, it can be fabricated at very low cost and printed circuit boards as a component or integrated into the board itself. In any case, they're widely used. The third type of antenna is the patch antenna. They're commonly used in communication and radar systems. One reason is that they can be integrated into low-cost substrates along with the electronics. MPT has developed several phased arrays using patch antennas, and the image shows one of the examples. It's important to remember that the size of the patch antenna itself is determined by three main constraints. The first is the operating frequency of the patch. As frequency goes up, the size of the patch decreases. Second, as the dielectric constant of the support material it goes higher, the size of the patch gets smaller. Third, 
the thickness of the sort uh, support substrate above the backside ground is a constraint. All these three must be balanced for each application. Patch antennas will continue to be very attractive antenna types. The fourth is the circular waveguide antenna. Circular waveguide antennas are also widely used. For instance, millions of them have been deployed in satellite TV antennas. It may come as a surprise to some that essentially every satellite TV antenna in the world uses a circular waveguide antenna as a feed for the dish. This is done since the satellite signal is circularly polarized and the circular waveguide can support the required polarizations. In fact, most satellite TV antennas, or at least many of them, use a dual polarization feed. MPT has developed a dual feed circular waveguide antenna with a microstrip probe for a satellite communication system. Let's take a deeper dive into the design of its circular waveguide antenna. As the image shows, there are three main physical features in the circuit of a circular waveguide antenna. First is the radius of the waveguide itself, which must be chosen carefully for proper function of the antenna. Second is a probe that's inside the antenna. Its length and diameter are important also. Third is the position of the probe in the circular waveguide. These three parameters basically control the function of the entire antenna and their physical parameters are critically important, even though there are other parameters, of course, that are important. Let's discuss each of those features. First is a radius of the circular waveguide. The waveguide can support several modes of operation, and the radius must be chosen so that it operates above the cutoff frequency of the desired mode and below the cutoff frequency of the first undesired mode. For those of you who are nerdier like me, the desired mode is called the TE11 mode, and the first undesired mode is called the TM01 mode. And here are the electric fill plots for those modes. The Excel files that I've linked below perform the required calculations for choosing the radius. For instance, using the Excel file in a desired frequency of 2.44 gigahertz, which is about the middle of the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi band, the Excel spreadsheet suggests a radius of 1.493 inches. However, it must be a minimum of 1.418 inches and no more than 1.95 inches. <laughs> the length of the antenna should be at least three quarters of a wavelength uh, in the waveguide, which is about 12 inches long, which can be difficult to achieve for many applications. A minimum length is about a half wavelength, which is seven and three quarter inches at 2.44 gigahertz. Some adventurous experiment is I've actually built this type of antenna from metal cans, vegetable cans, and it's called a cantenna. Next is the probe features. The probe length should be approximately a half wavelength in air. At 2.44 gigahertz, this comes out to be about 1.21 inches. But generally speaking, uh, wider probes can increase the bandwidth of the, uh, of the antenna itself. Finally, the probe should be located approximately a quarter wavelength from the closed end of the waveguide. This is calculated in the Excel file and is approximately 3.875 inches from the closed end. I know these three design features are only a small amount of the design considerations for a circular waveguide antenna. However, it does give you an overview of the, the main design constraints. Thank you for watching. In this video, we discussed four vital and widely used antennas. Now feel free to download the Excel spreadsheet I've linked below. It performs some of the calculations for the waveguide, the circular waveguide antenna design. If you're in the market for a phased array, then consider the experts here at MPT. Until next time, this is Rick Sturdivant with MPT.